Okay, so in terms of website security, I've updated this one from when you saw it before. Uh, basically, it's still a matter of authentication, roles, permissions, and all that kind of approach. They've just updated it, right? So the latest version again, in the history is called Identity. Not to be confused with how we know when we uh, create a primary key in SQL Server, identities is auto number type field, not that kind of identity. It's sort of the user identity, you might say. So there's lots of built-in ways using this to validate who people are and control what they have access to, right? Uh, if you don't start with a project that already has all the plumbing in place for it, you can just use NuGet to add what you need and away you go. Just a bit of a history then. Uh, the first versions that came out, and I was teaching this even just a couple years ago, was what was called the membership system. Uh, first came out with ASP 2.0 back in 2005. Very capable, very uh, powerful system, but fairly complex. I think there was close to 30 tables in the database <laughs> that were needed for this. It was quite a massive schema, and uh, it had tools, command line tools you could use to create that schema in any database you wanted. Then all these different providers you could plug in to work with it and so on. So it was good in many ways, but also was quite limited in others. One of the things that really bugged me the most, and whenever we came to a, like a community-sponsored project, people were always asking for things like that. It's one thing, in addition to maybe just username and password, to track additional information about a user on their site. Right? And the only way that that original system did that is they had one big, long text field that uh, all, any other data would be just put in there, like in a comma-separated file type format. So you were constantly parsing the data in and out of one field. So it was a real pain in the rear end to try and expand uh, and track additional information. So anyway, that's just kind of history. I'm sharing with you my, my gripes from the past. Another thing is it doesn't support OWIN, the new open source uh, identification system that uh, is the heart and soul of most of the like, OAuth and so on that lets you log into uh, Google with your Facebook account and vice versa and things like that. Simple membership, that's what we used, right? Definitely it was a great simplification, down to like five or six tables, nice, easy, simple little tables. Uh, quite good and much, uh, much improved. Uh, didn't have much backwards compatibility with all the custom providers from the old system and it didn't support Owen either. So then we kind of forgot about the next one mentioned here because it didn't really have much impact. Universal providers mainly came along to support Azure and storing data in Azure, uh, but it was as well limited. So they finally came out with the crowning jewel, learning from all their uh, efforts in the past. I won't say mistakes, I'll say efforts in the past. And they have the new ASP.inetity. So it's really like one system to rule them all. And it is pervasive. That's one reason why it's worth knowing something about because it works with web forms, MVC, web API, SignalR, all these different things, Windows Phone, uh, store apps, universal apps, they all tie into this one integrated security system, right? So what does it give us? Well, it's easy to add profile information for one thing, right? Because it supports, it's based on uh, entity, you can use code first, even migrations and so on. So as we've seen in the past, it's very easy to modify classes, change properties, add new properties, whatever and just you know, migrate the database if that's uh, the way you want to do it and away you go. So it uses code first, supports all these different social login providers, right? So you can log in with your Facebook account into your application and things like that. Of course, you'll store some information that share Facebook shares because uh, they've given permission, but you won't actually have their password or anything like that in your system. You get all the credentials passed over from Facebook and so on. Uh, roles and claims. So claims is like, now uh, it's kind of nitpicky the difference. Uh, roles are Boolean, right? Either you're in the administrator role or you're not. And that's all there is to it. Whereas with claims based authentication, it's more of a hierarchical arrangement. So you can have a more fine tuned arrangement built into what claims the authorized, or, uh, sorry, authenticated user uh, is authorized to do in your site. Anyway, also very unit testable, right? Nice bite-sized chunks, good for unit testing, and away you go. So coming to implement identity, one of the first things you probably want to think about is, are you feeling particularly mean and nasty or not? By that, I mean, there's a central spot in, it's found in most of the uh, uh, websites under app underscore start. There's the identity config file, and in there, 
is all the settings for how strong a password is required, right? So by default, they're pretty mean and nasty here. So one of the first things I usually do is I come in here and change almost all the options. Because <laughs> when I'm developing, I don't want to have to worry about including, you know, uh, non-lettered or digit characters like, you know, number symbols and percent signs and things like that. And I don't want to have to require both lower and upper case and digits and all that. So I'll come in here, I'll change everything except the first one. There's not much point in trying to change the password length to something less than six because this is the only one of these settings that is sort of pervasive in other areas, right? You will find other, in an MVC project anyway, you'll find other areas where that restriction of minimum of six characters is also enforced. So changing that one here doesn't do you a lot of good. But the rest of them, I'll usually do that. But what it really comes down to, the more important choice, is where are you going to store the data, right? Well, we remember, I know it's been a little while, and some of us in the room might be a little foggy on code first, MV, uh, entity framework and all that, but we remember that we could create our classes, our model classes, we would make a DB set, and then uh, code first would go and create the actual database. We would, if we were using migrations, we would add a migration and uh, it would actually write code that would be executed to create tables, add indexes, uh, things like that, right? It would do all the alters and drops and so on and so forth. Every migration would have an up and a down, so we could go forward through the migration steps or backward through them, and then make design changes to the database from our code itself. But the question is, okay, we have a database we've probably been using already for our uh, own data, our sort of uh, user tables, if you want to call them that, right? The actual project tables, customers, orders, whatever, right? And then by default, the system will usually create a separate database just to hold all the security information users and roles, etc. So your choice is, do I want to have two databases or do I want to have one? And if I'm going with one, should I just add the security stuff into my existing table or should I have planned ahead and done it all in the security table from the beginning? You know, and how do we change it once we're there and so on? Or do I want to continue with both separate databases, right? So it's some big decisions to make there and that's kind of what I'm going to address with our demo today. Uh, just to mention, can anybody think of one reason why you might want to have separate databases for your project data and your security? Why might you decide to go that route? You can use your authentications uh, for several different apps to open both platforms. Absolutely right. Excellent answer. So I'm sure you had the same one. <laughs> oh, okay, go ahead. More secure? More uh, secure? Possibly. Under some circumstances, that could very well be true, yeah. But the main thing that did occur to me as well, and I've done it in Azure, I've put up one database to hold all the security, and then you might have multiple applications, web apps and so on, and they can all use the same security database. So once they've established your login and your profile in one, it just carries over to all the other applications that you do. So that's without having to <laughs> worry about bumping into all the, putting all your projects and all their data in one database. So. That's one obvious reason why you might do it, or for added security, keeping it separate as well. Um, anyway, so uh, one of the advantages of having it all in the same database, can anybody think of an advantage there? Anyone? Yeah? Sorry? That's, yeah, exactly. You might, I mean, it, it, it's not possible usually to create things like uh, referential integrity relationships between tables that live in different databases. But if they're all in one database, you can actually have greater access to the information stored in user profiles and so on and uh, tie that in more directly with some referential integrity even possibly uh, to other tables in your actual application. So instead of just kind of having a copy of what their username is or their email is that you access from your own application, you have much greater access to utilize the data that's there. So that's one reason why you might have it all in one. Another thing that comes up is it's very easy when you go enable migrations way back, I know this is a long time ago, but we, when we enable migrations inside of a project, normally the system seems to be designed to just support one set of migrations. There is a way to fool the system and allow you to have migration separately working on two different DB contexts within the same project. But 
it's not the easiest thing to manage. Okay, it makes it much more challenging and difficult to manage. So that's another reason why people often like to put it all together in one database. Okay, so I thought we'd do a little bit of a demo today where we're going to go through, deal with some of these issues, and also show you one of the common approaches. If you've already got all your data in tables in a system that's working, and you just want to add the security into there, one of the ways to go about doing that. So I'm going to stop the PowerPoint now, I'll stop recording, and we'll start recording again when I'm ready to do the demo. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. There's a couple more slides. <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, is just a refresher for you, I should, while well, I have the PowerPoint open, talk about it, uh, of course, is how do we actually use this to control access, right? Well, this is what you would have been doing already, and this works with web API controllers as well as MVC controllers. We just put an annotation. That's all it is, right? You can throw an annotation. Oh, sorry, went one slide too far. An annotation right at the top of a controller class, for example, and then we can restrict access to that class, right? So if you just say authorized by itself without any other arguments being passed in, that only means that an anonymous user cannot go there, right? They have to at least be logged in. They have to uh, be authenticated in the system. Once they are, then they can go in. But then you can further refine it with things like as shown here with roles, and that can be a comma-separated list of multiple roles, right? So if you have like admin and managers and uh, whatever, whatever, right? You can just list all the different roles that should be allowed access to it. If they aren't in one of the roles, then they won't be, right? You can also do specific users. You can have a comma-separated separated list of usernames. And so there's some flexibility there. And the other thing, of course, is, and you might remember doing this because we did do it together, it's not just the controller, right? You might uh, leave this open so anonymous users can come to the controller and only protect certain actions. You remember within the controller, there'll be like a, you know, edit action and a delete action. Usually they're paired because there's one for the get and one for the post, right? But you can decorate them and put different restrictions on different actions in the same controller. So it gives you quite a bit of flexibility in terms of how you protect uh, the ability to actually access the controllers and their actions. And that's the most important part. We also did some work because we were doing MVC last term, putting code into the views so you can actually hide links and so on to users who aren't authenticated, right? So as this bit of code would show, instead of having the create new link sitting there on a view, you know, if anonymous users aren't allowed to create new records, you just put a little bit of razor code here using C-sharp syntax inside the view itself and the HTML of the view to basically only show the create link if they're logged in, if they're authenticated. Now, of course, that doesn't apply to Web API because it's, it's a separate thing. This is just in the view itself. And it's not enough to do, do this kind of coding. The most important thing is what we actually decorate on the controllers and their actions themselves. But I just thought I'd share those slides with you because it's kind of a refresher. And we'll do that in our little demo as well. Okay. Now, on to the demo.